Hello, welcome to the Christ Community Church podcast. I am Ryan Balby, the interim teaching pastor. And I'm Blake, and I'm the high school pastor. And we are diving into Sunday's message from April 9th, which was Easter Sunday, and talking the Easter message, which was titled, It's the Hope That Changes You. Yeah, and He is risen. He is risen indeed. Yes. Um, I I remember when I was a kid, uh, I was super competitive. Were you competitive as a kid? Yes. And we would always have an Easter egg hunt in my grandma's house. And she would always hide these golden eggs that had 20 bucks in them. And so she would let all the kids go. But I found myself finding every golden egg, but then she'd make me give up the money at the end to every kid that didn't get one. Wow. Is that fair or not fair? Um, it depends on your version of fairness, <laughs> I guess. It's not fair to you probably because you you found them. Yeah, but there is a reason to have hope. Yeah, uh, because he is, and it's not in golden Easter eggs. It's not in twenty dollars in them. It's not in golden Easter. Those eggs. get taken away apparently. <laughs> yeah, they do. But the hope we have in Jesus Christ stays forever. That does not get taken away. It does not get taken away. No. And I love how like, I love how many people showed up on Sunday. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate, you know, everyone who's listening is probably members of our church. And I think the church took the call seriously to go and invite people and to see if people will come. And we know that around Easter, people are a little bit more willing to come and check out church, maybe for the first time. Maybe they've come before, but, you know, there's something about Easter where people are like, okay, I got to be in church. And so we are glad that everyone was here. And, you know, it's just, it's fun to gather together to celebrate the resurrection, to celebrate Jesus and to worship together and you just have the energy of the the day and everyone's here and there's a lot of joy in that but then you got a lot of first time people as well and and guests and so um yeah a super exciting fun sunday and uh, hopefully um you know we just continue to see fruit from this weekend and we know god's up to something he's doing work in the hearts of those who attended and and uh, can't wait to see where it goes from here yeah and you uh you encouraged and invited people to receive christ the hope of the world and our prayer is that some people, and maybe you could be one of them watching, that you made that decision for the first time and just know we're praying for you and we're excited that you made that decision and um, press into that and, and yeah, continue to, to show up and be a part of the church. Yeah, and if you invited someone, continue to invite them back and continue to have these conversations, pray for them, um, you know, have spiritual conversations, ask them about what they believe and and what they think about the resurrection and all these different things. So, uh, you know, take them out to to lunch or something. Hey, I want to know how what you thought of Easter service. Let me take you out to lunch and and let's have a conversation about it. People people are more open when you buy them food. <laughs> feed feed their bellies, then feed their souls. Do you basically, wanna, do you want to buy me food, Ryan? No, I was hoping you would buy me food. <laughs> That's why I said it. Um, I love the approach that you took on Sunday. I. I nerded out a little bit and to some people they may have not enjoyed it as much, but like for, especially for me, I really enjoyed, you spent a good chunk of time talking about apologetics, the, uh, the, the proof that Christ existed and he is who he says he is and the legitimacy of the text. So I, thank you for taking that approach. I think that's the first time I've ever heard on an Easter Sunday, someone take that approach in my opinion. Yeah, it's it's something I've I've maybe shared in like a youth ministry or something before on that first Corinthians fifteen passage. But I just think when you look at the Easter story, there's not only the the information about Jesus and the resurrection, but there's also things that are right there that if you understand what's happening, or in First Corinthians, I mean you're just reading what he's saying. Like he makes a case of, hey, don't just listen to me. I've got a bunch of people that you can listen to, and here's all the reasons why you can trust that this really is what happened um, and you can believe that. And so we can you know, have the same, same trust and confidence. So I know a lot of people come with questions and with doubts and uh, you know, even, even Christians come and wonder about, can I really trust my faith that I have? Um, and how do I know that, that what we believe is truthful? And so I think there's things in the scripture that, that lay that out. And so it's fun to get an opportunity to do that um, and to just be able to share that because Again, it's important for solidifying our faith, but hopefully someone else heard that and is at least taking it a little bit more seriously, maybe coming to ask more questions because now maybe they're more open. You know, I think we, I don't know if we forget this. I don't, I, I assume everyone knows this. I, you know, I've worked with students a long time and not every student knew this, like someone would be shocked. Like there's no, there's no debate that 
Jesus of Nazareth existed? Like that's, that's not a question that any historian is debating. Who Jesus of Nazareth was uh, and what he said and what he did, there's questions. Now, 99% of what's in our Bible, everyone agrees to. Like they agree to a lot of his teachings on morality and different things like that. A lot of what he did, people who he hung out with, his Jewish background, like all these different things. But then they get the part about like him being God and the death Miracles. and resurrection and that kind of thing. And they get a little bit more like, ooh, I don't know about that. And I mean, same with the disciples, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Peter, like these people are not people that, that, that historians are questioning their existence or their reality. It's not like, is this a mythical figure or is this a real person? They know they're real people. So the question is, did they really say this and can they be trusted? And, and that's where I think Corinthians and even the, the resurrection account and Matthew and Mark and Luke and John help uh, kind of lay out the, the proof for their own text. Yeah, and I think you did a great job of laying that out in the simplest form possible because with each of those things that you were talking about with all the, the eyewitness accounts, the, the fact that Jesus went to specific people first and... Um, and uh, just the the authors Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, how they have their own uh, uh, their own testimonies, and how they have listened to other people's testimonies about Jesus as well. Um, <clears throat> I think you did a great job just laying that out and, and helping us understand the importance of apologetics because it is important. I I know, I, and maybe it's just newer, but. Growing up, like for me, I, like I, I believed in God. I didn't have a relationship with Christ yet. That wasn't until my early twenties. But I remember, like growing up, uh, I would always hear people arguing, "Oh, Jesus didn't really exist. He w wasn't actually real." But it, it feels like the further we get along, historians, like you were saying, most people can say now, "No, he existed." Like there's too much proof. Uh, to say that he did not exist. Yeah, yeah. Scholars are not going to argue his existence. Um, that might be a debate amongst those who have not studied just because you hear Jesus, you think of the the Christian view of Jesus, that he is the son of God. And so then maybe you're like, oh, wait, that can't be. So that person wasn't real. But again, historical Jesus is not, is, people aren't questioning that. Yeah. Why do you think that, what is it, what is it so challenging for people to accept or why is it so challenging for people to accept his deity? Well, because first of all, I mean, if someone comes and claims to be God, um, you should probably hesitate to believe them, right? Like that is not something you should just go and accept right away. Now, Jesus over his lifetime, certainly through his death and resurrection, seemed to have proved that. However, there were still those who wanted to push against it. And I think in a lot of parts, because Jesus doesn't just claim to be a savior. He also claims to be Lord. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, Romans 10, nine that we talk about a lot says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so Jesus came and challenged a lot of the status quo, even challenging a lot of the religious status quo and religious leaders and saying, Hey, there's, there's more that I'm asking from you. And really, I'm not asking you to elevate yourself. I'm asking you to elevate me. And, and so that challenged people because they had to kind of get out of their own way to say, hey, if this is real, then I can't be Lord of my life. I can't lead my own life anymore. Like I have to submit because if, if the son of God came, died and rose again, therefore demonstrating that he is who he claimed to be, I have to listen to him. Like it, it you know, that was kind of the last point. The resurrection requires a response. And when, when you see this happen, you, you are forced to either say, well, yeah, I've, like it, that's real. And so therefore I'm gonna submit to that or you have to like really do some 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 mental working on there to try and like try and act like it didn't happen the way it did happen. So I think that people are okay with accepting Jesus as a nice person, as mm. a decent moral teacher, as long as it doesn't offend their morality and what they want to do. As long as I can continue to live my life the way I want to, I appreciate you coming and and offering me heaven as long as it is what I want it to be. Right. And so that's I think what the big thing is is that hey, I'm willing to accept the resurrection as long as I don't have to change in ways I don't want to. And that's not what scripture teaches us. That's not what Jesus does. So I think that that's challenging. I think honestly, it's just a lot of like that fight of, I want to do my thing. And with Jesus, I can't. So I'm going to pretend like he's not who he claims to be. Yeah, we want, we want the benefits 
but we don't want to own up to our part, own up to our own sin. Um, you know, thinking about the resurrection and the fact that 500 people saw the risen Christ. I heard someone once say uh, that these people were hallucinating. I don't know if the text says that at some point, but I heard, I, I read uh, a scholar once say like, oh, people uh, thought that, uh, or, or they were hallucinating Christ. And 500 though? Sure, group like, hallucination, something like that. 500 people hallucinating, it just, it doesn't fit. Like it, it doesn't work. Yeah, and it, so that's when in Corinthians, when Paul says there's 500 witnesses, and I don't know that if he's including the others, because then he, he also says the 12, the apostles, he mentions himself, James and Peter, and so he mentions several others. So I don't know if they're included in the 500 or if that's separate, but either way, 500 is a staggering amount of people that you can present that say, hey, we have seen the resurrected Christ. And at the very least, you have to believe that they really believed it. Because when you look at where their lives started and where they went, I mean, you see some radical transformation in people, the disciples, you know, all martyred for their faith. And, and yet right before, like when Jesus is arrested, they scatter. Like they are afraid of what the Romans are gonna do, what the Jewish leaders are gonna do to them. When he is crucified, they're not there like at his feet, like saying, hey, no, this is our Lord and savior. They're busy denying him and running away from him. And, and then you see the transformation where they're then going and proclaiming to the point where they are, they are beaten, they're thrown in prison and they're killed for their faith. And so it's like, you just look at the transformation and, and at, at the very least, you have to accept that these men and women believed that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the savior, that he was the son of God, that he really had been crucified and resurrected because you're not doing that for your own personal gain. Like they, they, had, they had nothing to gain from this um, unless Jesus really was risen. And that's what Paul says. Like he says it in Corinthians. He says, if the resurrection didn't happen, our faith is meaningless. Like we are most to be pitied if our hope is just in this world. Um, but he says, but that's not the case. He has risen right. and therefore we have joy and hope and confidence. And we know that death has lost its sting. We know that we have victory and we're looking forward to this with a hope that that never ends, it doesn't perish, it doesn't fade, it stays there. First Peter says the same thing, it says, you know, we have a living hope that is, that is, is placed in heaven for us until the day that we um, are with Christ. So there's so much to look forward to. And again, that's what transforms people. That's what takes them from where we saw them up to the point of like through the death until the resurrection, we see these, these people are struggling. They don't get mm -hmm. it. Like they don't figure it out, they're scared, they're doing the wrong things. Post-resurrection, it finally clicks. The spirit comes and dwells with them and, and, and leads them into doing truly incredible things. And you see just how bold their faith is at that time. You see Peter, like he was bold prior, but now he's without hesitation, all in for Christ. Yeah, because he, he had all these mistakes pre-resurrection, pre-Holy Spirit. Like, you know, and, and we see that really in chapter 26 this is what we talked about last week peter denies christ three times in chapter 26 27 is the crucifixion 28 is the resurrection peter's restored and then you know in the book of acts which begins that next journey i mean peter is doing some incredible things in the name of the lord and so again you see paul killing christians and then turning and giving his life for for the cause like thomas was a doubter was like no nah, mm -hmm. unless unless i get to put my my fingers in the holes which is like gross by the way like who would want to do that but he's like he's like i'm not going to believe and, and then thomas would give his life for for christ and so it's just like you just see some you're like something something stirred in these in these people and and it's still happening today it's not it's not something that is just two thousand years ago i mean we see christians all around the world with this kind of faith yeah um and and it's because they know the hope in jesus of the resurrected christ yeah and i believe uh thomas he went on to plant the church in India. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, possibly it's either Thomas or James. I believe it's Thomas, but I believe also like he went on to plant like the most churches as well. Um, don't look it up <laughs> don't, for yourself. Don't quote you on that one. L look it up for yourself. But uh, but I, I'm fairly certain that was the case. So it's incredible just to see even his faith. 
saw someone who completely doubted Christ and and then was just like, I'm all in now. And I, I think even for us though, like we, even after coming to know Christ, like we still doubt at times. Sure. Like we, we question all the time. We question God's authority. We question his Well, will. it's like the story. There's, there's the moment where Jesus, I think it's right after he's come down from, um, from the mountain when he's been transfigured and he comes down and they were hoping to cast out a demon. And he says, why, why do you not believe? And the person says, I believe, help me in my unbelief. Like mm. we're always going to have those moments. We're always going to have some struggles. Um, and, and yet like we keep our eyes focused on Christ and we keep remembering the hope that we have in him and remembering that this is, this is not the end. And I think that's when we struggle is when we start to take our eyes off the hope of eternity and we start to put our eyes on the things of this world then it becomes a struggle. It becomes a burden um, because there's a lot of brokenness in this world. There's a lot of bad in this world. And so we can very quickly lose hope and then lose strength and lose confidence. And so we just have to constantly keep refocusing our eyes, refocusing our vision on the resurrected Christ and remembering like what he has done for us and the promise that we have in him. And, and, and it's that again, like I, I mentioned this in some of the services, I didn't mention it, all of them. But I mean, within the first couple hundred years of the resurrection, you had countless Christians being martyred for their faith. I mean, mm -hmm. people, the governments turned on the Christians and decided we're gonna make them the enemies um, for the state. And, and you had these Christians that really, they considered it a great honor to be martyred and to like in really horrible ways. And, and it's crazy because I, you know, I think about the, that for myself. I'm like, do I have that kind of faith mm -hmm. that would stand up and be like, yes, I wanna be counted amongst the martyrs. Um, you know, like that's significant, but it's because the resurrection is so real for them and hopefully it's real for us as well. Um, but I think when, when we have that hope, when we really trust in Christ, again, it just gives us that confidence to face anything that we're going through. Um, whether that be just friends mocking us or people, you know, relationships being lost or, or, or just the challenges of like loving and forgiving the way Christ did, that can be really difficult. So our, we have to constantly not just on Easter, right? We have to constantly remember the resurrection and the hope we have in Jesus. Yeah, and I like what you said, not just on Easter, like we have to, uh, every Sunday should be a celebration of what Christ did. The fact that he put his life on the line for us so that we could live and we should constantly be celebrating that and, and submitting our lives to him. Um, it goes past an emotion, of course, like sure. Easter Sunday, it's very emotional, very exciting and whatnot. Um, I think really at that point, your faith is tested by uh, the consistency of what does that look like between you and God? Like, how often are you spending time with him? How often are you not, not, not even like forcefully carving out time? Sure, that's a practice, but at the same time, does your heart desire to know him? Mm -hmm. Do you have a heart that says, God, there's nothing else in this world that I want but you and, and, and continuously lead my heart towards that truth? I think that should always be our attitude. So like with that, um, it's much more than just the knowledge of the resurrection. We can believe in the resurrection, but there has to be further steps. Like, and I think what that lo looks like is like, what does the Bible say? Like confess with your mouth and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but believe in your heart and, uh, and like confess Jesus and you will be saved. And so, like this idea of confessing, but also that word belief is an action, it is living out your faith in him and, and not just the knowledge of him, but submitting to him as Lord and saying, I am your disciple. You are the king of my life. How can I live for you fully? Yeah, faith, faith is going to lead to action. I mean, that's really the book of James. That's what he writes all about is that if you have faith, it's going to lead you to transformation. It's going to lead you to doing things that demonstrate the love of Christ. And you see it in Matthew 28. I mean, when the, when the women hear the news, they, they run off, it says they run off with fear and joy, going to respond to the call that God gave to them to go and tell the disciples, to go and tell the 12 that, hey, this is, this is what has happened and come and hear the good news. Then they meet Jesus along the way 
And they immediately just fall at his feet and worship, which is really an interesting passage, actually, because they it says they grab his feet. Uh, feet were like a sign that he wasn't a ghost. So it's a sign that he really is resurrected because your feet are on the ground and they didn't believe that ghosts had feet at the time. So anyways, just a fun fact for you there that that one of the reasons they talk about the feet is to say, no, this is a, a real resurrected mm -hmm. Christ, not just a spirit, but like a physical body he had present as well. Um, it also made me think like not to... Uh, long before that jesus was, was the one like washing yep. their feet yep and how you see the roles are reversed now yeah where they're clinging to his feet yeah yeah and so um uh so yes i, I think that it's going to it's going to lead to action it did for the women right they go and tell the disciples the disciples begin to tell one another obviously the gospel starts spreading out um you know when the apostle paul meets the resurrected christ like he he spends time learning about like who Jesus really is and, and what Jesus really called people to. And then he goes and starts proclaiming the message as well. So it should lead to an individual sort of pursuit of God that is, is done, I say individual, but done within community. But like whether you're at church on a Sunday or in a small group during the week or on your own, there should be a pursuit of Christ, a pursuit of his love, of his knowledge, of what he wants us to do. And then we should go and we should be declaring this message. I, I mean, you think about an Easter, everyone's like social, I'll take social media, for example. Everyone's posting on social media on Easter Sunday that he is risen and posting the good news. Praise God for that. Um, and, and I'm not saying that you have to post a Bible verse every single day, but like that should always be our mentality that we encounter people and we want to share the good news. I mean, I had, I had three, different, three different groups of people and, and grand, not all of them are Protestant Christians, but come to my door on the Saturday before Easter knocking because they wanted to evangelize their, like some Protestant Christians and other, you know, other denominations, other or other uh, religions, um, not denominations, sorry. Um, yeah, but you get the point. Uh, but like, but they wanted to talk about Jesus. It's like, you know, like, oh, we know it's Easter, so we wanna talk about Jesus. And again, I'm not trying to give like any one method, but I'm just saying that like our hearts should be to grow deeper in our relationship with him. Our hearts should be led to worship. Our hearts should be led to sharing the good news. Because again, if the resurrection is real, and it is, like it should change who we are, but that gives us hope. Why would we not want to share that with others? Mm -hmm. So it absolutely should lead to not just receiving salvation, but it should lead to transformed lives like the disciples. And and you know what? If If you're martyred, and you're praising God for being martyred because that spreads the gospel, like praise God for that. If you're not martyred and, and God gives you just a life to proclaim the gospel, praise God for that. Like, but, but praise God that he allows us to do the work that he's called us to do. And he brings us into a hope that doesn't just exist in eternity, but even here and now, like we have been given new life and a new mission, a new purpose. And so that's what the resurrection does. It changes everything. We have this hope to look forward to, but we also have a mission and a life to live here, proclaiming the good news. Mm, yeah, that's good. Uh, we'll close with this. Uh, people made a decision to follow Christ on Sunday, and we praise God for that. And we're, we're, we're just thankful for that, that mm -hmm. we're seeing new brothers and sisters come to him and receive him as Lord and live out their life for, them, for him. How, how would you encourage them to take further steps in their faith? Yeah. First and foremost, I mean, make sure that you've talked to someone about it, like some uh, another follower of Christ who maybe is a little further along. Probably you, they were invited by someone. You were invited by someone. Um, so, you know, talk to the person who invited you uh, or, you know, send an email, ryan at cccnow.com. Like, let me know. Like, if you have no one, if you can't find anyone else, then like, let me know and we'll, we'll connect you with someone or, or, or we'll talk. Like, but it's just it's just good to share that and maybe to get a little more personal feedback. Um, but the other thing is, you know, I'm always going to point people to the word of God and say, Hey, like take up one of the gospels, take up the gospel of John. Um, I, I love Matthew. Mark is the shortest. So if you want to, you know, try and get through one quickly, you can go through Mark, but, but John, I think is a great one because Jesus really declares who he is in the gospel of John. And so just kind of start reading and exploring, um, spend time in prayer, just, just talking to God. But the other thing is, you know, because it's, it's early on, you want to make sure that you surround yourself with some some good brothers and sisters in Christ. So you need to make sure that you are showing up to church, get into yeah. a group, get connected to some people, and just, again, let people know, hey, I'm new to this whole faith thing. And, and be okay asking questions. 
um, and, and and discovering that kind of faith. But but get with some brothers and sisters because they can help make sure that like you're reading the text the right way. Because there are some some hmm. some things we have to do as we read the text to make sure that we're reading it correctly. Um, not all of it is as easy as just reading the words and being like, oh, this is exactly what it means. Uh, there are there you know you got to understand some historical context and different things. So re- be in scripture be in prayer, be in worship, uh, be surrounded in community, um, I think are, are important next steps. That's awesome. Yeah. It just reminds me when I first became a follower of Christ, I, I read the book of Deuteronomy. I'm like, we're supposed to do all this. Oh yeah. That's <laughs> like much it, later. And I was trying to correct someone like, no, you're supposed to actually do this. This is what the Bible says. And then he like had to come back and correct me. He's like, you got to put it into context, like yeah. <laughs> when it was written, who it was written to. And then I'm like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Don't so, start with Deuteronomy. So we're not supposed to kill bulls anymore or uh, <laughs> whatnot. So, uh, yeah, if you're a new Christian, uh, get in community. It's uh, the best place for you to be. But uh, great message on Sunday. Uh, he is risen indeed. We are thankful for that truth. Uh, I'm excited. We're, we're starting our relationships series coming up this Sunday, um, and it, it should be good. So thank you for joining in today on our podcast, and we'll see you at the next one. See you then.